Good morning. Welcome to worship. Welcome to Babylon. There's not been any change in our theology of any kind. This is set up for VBS. It brings me to my first announcement. All week we're going to have children here learning about God through the book of Daniel, which takes place in Babylon. We would like your help Sunday, June 17th after worship to take down the decoration. So if you could spare just a few minutes of your time after worship next Sunday, stick around, help us take Babylon down and go back to the traditional church setup that we are all used to. Um, today after worship, we'll have a representative from Treasure Valley Care Coalition to present to you the Senior Blue Book resources. These are resources for senior citizens, everything from housing to hospice to community resources, articles on health care, subjects that matter to you. They'll be presenting in the fireside room after worship, and there are cookies. They look pretty good. <laughs> Youth group will be available today after the worship service over in the hall, in the fellowship hall, to take sign-ups for a blood drive that our youth group is putting on. Sign up with them. The blood drive will be on Friday, June 29th. There's a typo in the bulletin. June 29th, Friday. That's when the blood drive is going to be from 11.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Give blood, give life, help some people right here at your church. Lastly, our Congregational Life Committee is going to be organizing another lunch outing, this one to the Parma Ridge Winery. So that should be a lot of fun. That will be Saturday, June 29th at 1 p.m., We'll leave here from the church at noon on that day. Sign up on the back table to let Congregational Life know that you are coming. With that, let's stand and greet each other with a friendly welcome. Hello. Wait, is this on? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> God, who today opened the way of eternal life to every race and nation by the promised gift of the Holy Spirit, scatter this gift far and wide by the preaching of the gospel. May the good news reach the ends of the earth through Jesus who lives and reigns in the unity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand and open up your hymnals to page 482 and 477 and the words that are also found on the screen. Let us continue in praise as we sing.
Please be seated, and I'd like to invite all the children to come forward for the children's message. It's a little harder to get up here, isn't it, with Babylon here in these hedges. Well, I want to talk to you today about what you see up here. You notice that everything looks different. Well, I want to tell you a story about something that happened in Babylon. Three men named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they came to Babylon and they worshipped God. But in Babylon, that wasn't okay. The king of Babylon didn't want people to worship the one true God. So the king of Babylon had these three guys thrown into a fiery furnace. But do you know what happened? In that fiery furnace appeared an angel of God, and it protected them. And do you know what the lesson that story is for us? Well, it's that sometimes it's hard to be faithful to God. Sometimes around us are circumstances that make it hard to be faithful. Maybe our friends don't like God. Maybe we're in a place where... Uh, it's not allowed to be faithful to God in different ways, but God will always help us be faithful to him. That's the message of that story. It's an amazing story. We're going to be learning about Babylon and how to be faithful to God all week long at VBS. And I hope I see you there. Let's say a prayer. Lord, we thank you that even though it's sometimes hard to be faithful to you, to do the right thing, to be honest, to obey you, Lord, you will help us. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's children said, Amen. Can you do it? No, 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 no. Come on, come on. Can't be here. Now you're in trouble. I have a mic. Okay, my, I'm going to strive for an actual mission, uh, a minute for mission, but it may go slightly over. I just wanted to talk briefly um, and give you an update. In the past, you know, our youth group has done a mission trip. The last two years, we've gone to Seattle and helped a couple different areas, groups. This year, we wanted to focus on doing something locally. So we minimized it down to a retreat of three days, which is really all we did in Seattle anyway. We're about three days worth of work. The rest of it was drive time and a fun day. Um, and so what we wanted to do is keep it local and uh, have the kids meet here and go out and do mission activities during the day and then come back and um, camp somewhere at the, po at the point we were making this plan um, at night to stay in a tent so we can kind of get a little bit of a bonding opportunity for the kids and some of the adults. Well, <clears throat> what we found out is that um, kids are really busy in the summertime and it's hard to schedule activities with groups with four kids. So what we've decided to do is um, open it up to making an intergenerational retreat, uh, from a mission retreat. Some of you may have noticed that in your email or in the bulletins or the announcement that Aaron has, has mentioned, but we thought, why not overkill it? And so I thought I would get up to and I'm going to take this out because my back's hurting. I'm bending over so much. All right. So um, just to update you guys, uh, the current plan is June 27th, 28th, and 29th. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday we are going to do mission opportunities. Um, for sure on that Wednesday, we're going to do something. We're waiting on an activity exactly from MAF, Mission Aviation Fellowship. Many of you have heard of them. They're um, a very active mission group and their base, their global headquarters are based right here in Nampa. Um, and also that Friday, we're gonna host a blood drive here at the church, as uh, Pastor Aaron mentioned earlier. Um, what we're hoping is that we get a few more of you that may, if you're so inclined, either physically or, or just have the energy to do it, to volunteer to help on one of those days. Because what that allows us to do, if we know there's a few more of you that would like to help in any way, we can communicate that back to the groups and they can make sure they're prepared for us. Um, a couple other areas we thought we would help would be the um, uh, Salvation Army Community Center. Linda had spoke about, um, I believe it was last week or the week before. Um, we'd like to do something with them, so we'll be contacting them to see if they have any needs. Um, and then Hands of Hope, who we've been involved with once in a while in the past. Um, 
Karen took a trip with through there, a tour through their facility, and they've got some need as well. So we're going to try to volunteer with them either half day or full days. So my appeal is twofold. Number one, um, to reiterate, we have a signature in the, or a, a sign-in log if you guys would like to volunteer to come give blood on Friday, uh, the 29th of June. I think the first time is at 11.30, and it goes till either 4.30 or 5 for all of the sign-ups. So, um, and I volunteered, and I usually come close to passing out every time, but I'm going to give it a shot again and <laughs> see if it works. Um, and then also the other side is if you would like to volunteer to help in any way. It don't have to be all three days. It can be one day here, a half day, whatever. Uh, just come see myself or Karen, and we'll make sure we have you signed up, and then we'll communicate exactly what we're doing. And then if you sign up and find out, and no, I, I can't get on my hands and knees and weed, that's okay too. But if we know that there's interest, then we can possibly communicate that to the groups and they can give us something. So thank you. Hear the call to confession. God is like a loving parent. We are God's children. As a child runs to a mother's lap, so we approach God with prayer, asking that our sins might be forgiven. O oh God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Jesus Christ, your Son, who the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God forever and ever. Amen. Jesus Christ offered himself an atonement for all sin. United Jesus Christ in faith, we draw near to God as new creations. In Christ we are forgiven. Amen. seated. We come together now in a time of prayer. We lift up both our praises and our requests to God, and we'll close by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Please join with me. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for gathering us here on this beautiful day. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Lord, we thank you for the mission of our church to reach out into the community, to tell them who you are and how much you love them. We pray for all those students who will be here this week at Vacation Bible School. We pray that you open their hearts, that they be ready to hear the message of who you are, that you are with them, that you love them, that when they are afraid, when they're confused, they have a God that they can run to that will shelter them, protect them, and love them for all eternity. Lord, I thank you for all those who've worked to make this VBS possible, for those leaders who will be working with those children. I pray that you bless them, that the ministry that they would undertake in the next week would bear fruit, that they would be filled with joy and purpose at the good work that they will accomplish. Lord, we lift up to you now all those among us who are in need, all those who are lonely, all those who are sick, all those who are grieving. We pray for Gary Dakota's mother who broke her hip and is struggling. We ask your healing to be with her, that your wisdom be with her doctors and her family who cares for her. Lord, lift her up and comfort her with your spirit. Lord, we know that there are many here among us who are grieving. The loss of loved ones, the loss of dear friends. 
And no matter how long life is, Lord, it's always too short. So we come to you asking for comfort in the face of death, our greatest enemy. Lord, give us faith and hope that that enemy has been defeated through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we hold fast to him. May we go to him in prayer. May his spirit comfort us. And most of all, Lord, make this church, make our shared love a witness that through the Holy Spirit, you are king, you are Lord, and you are the conqueror of death. We lift up these prayers in the name of Jesus who died and rose for us, and we pray just as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Many times our sermon hymn is a hymn of meditation. So we sit. Today we sing a hymn of praise. So if you are able, please stand.
Well, I thought I'd transport you all to Babylon along with the kids this week. We're going to step into the world of Babylon and explore what it was like a little bit then. The theme of our VBS is how to be faithful to God in a time and a place where it's difficult, where there's some hostility to the faith. And I want to set the stage a little bit. In the 7th century BCE, the kingdom of Babylon conquered the kingdom of of Judah, of Israel. And Babylon's foreign policy worked this way. When they conquered a nation, they took the nobles, the educated, the skilled tradesmen, those who could read and write, anyone who they might find valuable, they took them captive and brought them back to the capital of the Babylonian Empire and kept them there as prisoners. The story of the book of Daniel takes place in Babylon and it tells the story of those faithful Jews who lived in Babylon and struggled to remain faithful to their God in a kingdom, in a land that was hostile to their faith. The scripture comes from Daniel chapter 3. It's a little bit of a longer narrative, but I want to read you the whole thing. And it it tells a famous story of, of three men who were placed in a situation where they had to choose between their safety and faithfulness to their God. Listen to the word of the Lord. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and six cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that he had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I have made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego set, replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. 
The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched. There was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This is the word of the Lord. Excuse me while I come down from the palace. Two novels every high schooler has to read, 1984 and Brave New World. They're assigned in almost every high school. I had to read them both. They're two stories that tell about a dystopian future, a time and a place where the population is oppressed, dominated, controlled in every way. Now, 1984, this takes place under the rule of Big Brother. The oppression in 1984 is imposed from above by a government who watches everything the people do, controls where they go, even controls what language they speak. The government watches and controls everything. People in 1984 obey because they are forced to. Brave New World tells a different story of oppression. It's an oppression of a very different kind. It's an oppression, you might say, by comfort and pleasure. In Brave New World, there's no visible government that imposes its will upon the people, but nobody rebels, nobody dissents, nobody disagrees. Why? Not because they can't, but because they don't care. They are so comfortable, they are given so many pleasures that they don't care to know the truth or to set themselves free. Everyone is addicted to a drug called Soma that takes away all pain, mental and physical, People are given the entertainment, the pleasure that they need, and no one cares. No one cares enough because they are so comfortable, so pleased. No one wants to rebel. And my high school English teacher, after we had read both of these books, assigned an interesting essay. She asked us to write, which of the two visions of oppression do you think is more likely to happen here in America? Which of these two do you think bears the most resemblance to the kind of problems, oppression, domination that we face. Now, you could make an argument for both, I think. You can see some elements of a surveillance state. But I thought then, as I think now, that Aldous Huxley's vision of a brave new world where nobody rebels because everyone is pleased and comforted into submission is far more likely, far closer to what we face. Now in Babylon, the oppression was clearly of the 1984 type. King Nebuchadnezzar controlled everything. He ordered and commanded loyalty, as you heard in the story, at the cost of death. Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had to obey because King Nebuchadnezzar said so. But those three men maintain their faith in a hostile environment. But I think today the hostile environment for faith 
is much less 1984 style and much more Brave New World style. I think for us, we do live in a hostile environment, a culture, a world where it's hard to be faithful to God, but it's more for the reasons in Brave New World. It's not against the law to be a Christian. It's not banned to read your Bible or to worship in public. But there are forces, there are other pleasures, seductions in our society that make us not want to. And I want to just talk about three. You could, you could go on, especially a preacher, you could go on forever and complain. But I'll limit myself to three, and then I want to talk about where the hope is. Uh, but I think the first, the first force in our culture that makes this a hostile environment for faith is consumerism. The way buying and selling dominates all of our life. I read an interesting article a few weeks ago about a woman named Valeria Ferrara. She's an Italian citizen. She works at a Calvin Klein in the city of Rome. And Ferrara wanted Sundays off to spend with her husband and two-year-old son and to go to church. She requested from her management the ability to stay home with her family on Sunday. And as a response, they transferred her to a store 30 miles away, which made it almost impossible for her to balance life as a mother and a wife and a faithful Christian. Well, she sued in Italian courts, and she won her case. The courts ruled that Calvin Klein had to, one, let her return to her original store, and two, had to allow her Sundays to worship and spend with her family. That's a great victory for her. But what about for the millions of Christians who, for economic necessity, have to work on the Lord's Day? What about all those who choose, because it's so seductive, to spend their day shopping instead of worshiping? It's just a symbol. It's just a symbol for how making money and spending money has consumed almost all of our waking life. If our eyes are open, we're either making money or we're spending it. And if there is a devil, that's what he's got to want. He wants us to be so busy getting and spending that we don't care about the truth, about freedom, or about God. Brings me to my second force that I think makes our culture a bit hostile to the Christian faith, and that is entertainment, hedonism. We all know that it takes time to worship God. You have to give your time to worship, to pray, to serve. But there's so many more enticing things to do, aren't there? Imagine with me, if you will, and I saw this somewhere, and I wish I could remember who wrote it. But we imagine a tombstone for the typical American. The generic American tombstone. What would be inscribed on that tombstone that describes the average American life. Well, one cynical suggestion is, here lies one who was very well entertained. It's cynical, but it's not all wrong, is it? If we're not making money or spending it, we're being entertained. And there are so many better things to do than to read the Bible, to worship, to pray, to serve. We're offered so many more opportunities, so many easier pleasures. And those easier pleasures crowd out the more difficult ones that are involved in serving God. Fahrenheit 451 is another book that talks about a dystopian future. And in Fahrenheit 451, books are burned. Books are illegal. But we can imagine a future like that, not where books are burned and illegal, but where books are free, but nobody reads them because nobody cares. Because there are easier, more sensuous pleasures available. This is why I say that the kind of hostility to the Christian faith is much more brave New World style for us than 1984. How do we convince people to worship when there's so many better options, so many easier options, so many more pleasurable options. The, the worship of God isn't illegal. Reading the Bible's not against the law. 
There's no king, there's no government that's watching you, that's going to stop you. But more and more people choose not to because the culture offers them more seductive, easier pleasures. The third and last example I'll give of something about our culture that's hostile to the Christian faith is freedom. Our obsession with freedom. When I, before I wrote this sermon, or after I wrote this sermon, I heard the news that Anthony Bourdain committed suicide. And Anthony Bourdain, if you don't know who he is, he's a, he's a writer and a TV uh, personality. He travels around the world. He eats food. But he's a brilliant writer, and he was a hero of mine. And he committed suicide this week. And as I read an article about him, I saw some interesting, troubling information. Over the last 10 or 15 years, suicide in America has risen 30%. It's a mental health epidemic, and I don't have the answers. I don't fully understand it. But the story I wanted to tell is of a suicide, <clears throat> and I think based on the statistics, it's, much, it's that much more appropriate. The University of Virginia has a special student housing area called The Lawn that dates all the way back to the time of Thomas Jefferson. That school is very old, and the best and the brightest students at the University of Virginia are allowed to live in the apartments on the lawn, and they form a community of, of the smartest, hardest, work, hardest working students on campus. And about 10 years ago, a young, bright student committed suicide. And he lived on the lawn at the University of Virginia. When the reporters came uh, and the police came to interview his friends, his fellow students who lived with him, it turns out they all knew that he had talked about committing suicide, that he had planned to commit suicide. They knew it was coming. They weren't surprised. And when they were asked, well, why didn't you stop him? They all said almost the same thing. They said, well, it was his choice. We had to respect his choice. These students, whatever else you might think about them, were intelligent and hardworking, earnest and sincere, and they could find no higher value than freedom. They could find no higher value that would justify their violating his freedom of choice. Our culture has a very strange, from a historical point of view, understanding of freedom. That freedom is the absence of constraint, the lack of limitation on our choices. Freedom's unlimited choice, but that's not the biblical understanding of freedom. The biblical understanding of freedom is the freedom to know the truth and to live it out. Freedom's not just the lack of restraint and unlimited desire, but people are held up an image of freedom that is the absence, the absence of constraint and nothing else. And not only that, that freedom of choice is the highest value. Now, freedom is wonderful. I'm not a fascist. I'm not in favor of control like 1984. But there are higher values than freedom. And one of them has to be love and life. But sadly, our culture holds out an idea of freedom that's quite different. And those who follow it, I'm afraid, are pulled further and further away from faith. Because if this is freedom, unlimited choice, well, then God is just a tyrant. Because we do have a God that says no. A God that says thou shalt and thou shalt not. And true freedom is obedience to a God who is love, a God who is life. But what's the hope? In a culture that's hostile to faith through consumerism, through entertainment, through an idolatrous kind of freedom, what's the hope? Well, the answer is in the story. The solution is not to overthrow the tyrant. It's not to attack the evils that we see. It's to be faithful, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are willing to give their lives. To do the hard thing. 
to worship when there are better things to do, when there are easier pleasures at hand, to pray and to serve when your friends and neighbors would rather be shopping or being entertained, to hold up a God who has a vision and a set of values that are more important than unlimited freedom. The hope and the salvation is in our faithfulness. That faithfulness was transforming for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It left us a witness that has stood the test of time over 2,500 years later. We know their story because they were faithful in a hostile environment. And yeah, our hostility is different from theirs. But there are forces in our culture, in our world, that suppress faith, that seduce us, that pull more and more people away. And the salvation is in our faithfulness, in your faithfulness. I pray that God would give you that faithfulness, that our church would be a witness to it in this community. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, as we witness to who you are, to your goodness, to your truth, and to your love, we pray that you would help each of us live our faith the way Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. That we'd be willing to sacrifice. That we'd be willing to say no to the forces in our world that pull us away. Lord, may our faithfulness and the faithfulness of all those Christians in this room be a witness that there's something better than entertainment. Something more noble and higher than buying and selling and a kind of freedom that is fullness of life and not just unlimited choice. Make us witnesses to this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
let us remain standing and open up our hymnals to page 361, How Firm a Foundation. That soul that all hell shall endeavor to shake, I shall never, never forsake. That's the promise of God. Hear the benediction. May the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.